Welcome everyone to LinkedIn for Authors. My name's Sue Elson and I welcome you today, 8th of June, and hopefully there'll be lots of information that you can share. And also I'd like to acknowledge all the people who've come to previous webinars in this LinkedIn Insight series. The recording will be on my YouTube channel later today. So hopefully that will work for you. I'll just triple check that you can all see. If you'd like to pop in the chat that everything's working okay and you can see things that are happening. Also, what type of author you are, what sort of genre, any questions you'd like to ask, it's all going to be part of today's presentation. I can handle questions as we go through and also at the end. So uh, let's fire away. I hope you find it of practical use and that you can actually implement some of the changes as well. So I'll pop my camera on as well. I'll keep the eye on the chat. Uh, hi Bev uh, and all I can see are the people, not you or the slides. Hopefully you can see the slides now. So um, let me know if you can't. Hi Barbara, hi Bev, that's better. Excellent. We're all in line. I've, I've just been to Sydney and got back so I'm a little bit uh, out of whack with uh, time zones and delayed flights and so on and so forth but here we are today. So what I'm going to focus on is obviously 10 techniques for authors on LinkedIn and happy Wednesday from Sarah. Not yet an author, no problem Jim, this is definitely for you as well so no problem there. Thanks Ken, I'm glad you managed to get through. I know there was a few challenges working out whether you've been registered or not but you're definitely here. That's fantastic. Um, I'm also going to show you some actual ways you can use LinkedIn and ways to manage your LinkedIn activity in 20 minutes a week. I know that most authors want to be writing, not <laughs> using social media. And in fact, a lot of writers, they, they want to focus on the book. And of course, we all know that it's only the books that get promoted that actually sell. So, uh, you know, how can you use it? Um, Lily Arns mentioned she's an author of a number of personal development novels for youth and adults and a couple of picture books and some plays. So lots of different things to share on LinkedIn there. One of the other workshops that I ran recently was LinkedIn for Creatives. And if you haven't seen that, I really encourage you to watch it right through to the end. We had a lovely conversation at the end. So whilst the formal part of this presentation will go for an hour, I'm happy to stay as long as you like afterwards and answer any questions. I'd also like you to acknowledge the things that you have done as we go through these slides, but also hopefully you'll be able to identify some things that you will be able to update on your LinkedIn profile um, after the webinar as well. Special offer, you can get access to my first four books uh, via my website. They're listed on ResearchGate, which are um, Sarah's narrative nonfiction. Hi, Dave, nice to see you, audiobook producer. Um, uh, my latest offer, I'm getting very distracted today, LinkedIn stats and backup spreadsheet, usernames and password spreadsheet. All my clients tell me that's the number one thing that I've taught them is to keep a lot, list of all their usernames and passwords. Um, it, it's tremendously helpful if you're going to outsource any activities and you've got somebody else that you would like to do uh, some work with. So yeah, that's all available just for turning up. There's the link, suewelson.com slash latest dash offer. Hi Jacqueline, uh, nice to see you as well. Now, what I also do on all of these webinars in the series is I invite you to connect with me on social media. And if you go back to the very first one I did for career specialists and business coaches, you'll see the numbers that were against all of these. So as we go through each month, we see how the numbers are increasing. Obviously, I've got a bit of work to do on Instagram and YouTube, uh, but LinkedIn, as you can obviously see by the numbers there, is my favourite. You can subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter so that you get a notification when it comes in. Don't clog up your inbox. But if you prefer the old fashioned email, it's the same content and you can subscribe to that as well. Every newsletter includes a um, piece of information on LinkedIn, some new feature. I am so thrilled at the number of new features that LinkedIn is constantly adding. So quick fast facts about me. My career started at Westpac. Uh, the first bank in Australia and I started there six days after my last year 12 exam, worked there for 11 years in lots of different roles, moved from Adelaide to Melbourne and haven't really had a real job since. My first three books were published in 2016, three 80,000 word books I wrote in eight months. 
mind you, that was the writing time. It wasn't the thinking time that went into those books. And I'm sure you all know, uh, you know, that obviously the difference between writing and thinking is, is a huge difference. And of course, there's lots of techniques you can use to help you write. For anybody who's not comfortable with a keyboard, like I did learn how to type, I'd like to remind you, voice to text is amazing. And voice to text really works well on your phone. And the reason it works so well on your phone is phones are designed for voice. So I've actually found voice to text works much better on my phone than on my computer or laptop. And so I definitely encourage you to consider getting, you know, perhaps the first draft out voice to text if you, if you don't want to get bogged down with the actual process of writing. I also find that when I'm, when I'm writing my poems, I actually prefer to handwrite them rather than type them up. I seem to think better with my mind. So, you know, do whatever works for you. Yes, sir, is a fantasy writer. Wow, we get a lovely variety of people in here. That's terrific. So anyway, I'm a member of a number of professional associations, the Melbourne Press Club since 2008, Career Development Association of Australia since 2015, and the others after that. And I have three websites, uh, two social enterprises, Newcomers Network and Campbell Network, and then my books are on 120 Ways Publishing. So for me, I chose to be what I call independently published. I don't use the word self-published because there's a bit of a, you know, it's not so nice to be known as a self-published author. But thank the Lord for Ewan Mitchell, my author advisor, who has shown me what to do, how to do it. And I thoroughly recommend if you want some guidance on getting your book to print, that you book some time with Ewan. He will help direct you with the steps if you'd like to manage most of that process yourself. Just as a little heads up, I plan to write at least 10 books before I classify myself as an author. Now we all know there's stories of people who've written one book and it's been a bestseller, but I just love writing and I actually believe my writing's got better. But the funniest part about writing is you go back and look at your first book and you think, my goodness, did I write that good on the first book? And so you, although I can see the transformation, I can also see what I did well in the first one. And the first book I wrote, was 120 ways to achieve your purpose with LinkedIn. And because it was something I knew so much about, it was very easy for me to sort of aggregate that information and put it together. So don't start off with the most difficult project, you know, please um, consider doing one of the easy ones first. And also, if you haven't actually published a book yet, I really encourage you to start a blog or a website or publish your content on LinkedIn or on uh, Medium or other platforms and see if you can get a bit of an audience for your writing. Because in the past, I've interviewed a lot of authors and they all say that they had to get an audience before they wrote their book. So yeah, just keep these things in mind. So for this event, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, the indigenous people of whichever nation you're on, and uh, obviously pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This presentation is for any level of writing or anybody who's interested. It doesn't have to be an author, but obviously the content is designed around being of use for an author. I'll just make sure we are still recording. Yes, um, it is only information. It's not professional advice for your personal circumstances. The slides and video recording link will be emailed to everyone who registered and there could be other people who come later. Uh, oh, from Queensland, excellent. Uh, another person in the chat, Delaware, USA. Woohoo! hi, Jim. Uh, tell us what time it is there. I'm impressed by your commitment to, to showing up live. Uh, you can leave your video camera off and your microphone on mute while I'm doing the presentation just to make sure that everybody can see it. And I'm going to assume there's a varied level of knowledge and experience. 10.09 p.m. Well done, Jim. Tokyo. Wow, this is exciting. Um, excellent. I love having an international audience. And uh, as I said, please add questions in the chat. You can learn a lot more about me on my website, suelson.com. I do recommend that for all of you to have your own website. Now, if you don't want to spend any money, you can set up a Google website for free. So you go to business.google.com. I'll pop that in the chat and you use your Gmail email address if you've got one or you create a Google account. And after you've created that Google business profile, which again can be in your own name, um, on the left hand side of the menu, 
you will be able to create a free website and that will get you going. So there's no reason not to have a website. You can get started immediately. Um, I will be asking you what's been most helpful to you at the end. That feedback is really useful for me. And I'll also be recommending that you find a way to say thank you. On my LinkedIn for Creatives event, I had five people write me a Google review and one person write me a LinkedIn recommendation. I was so excited. So if there's something that's been of value, um, there'll be a link at the end and I invite you to write a review. So as I've said, the definition of an author for this particular event is you can be a student, you can be a graduate, you could be thinking about writing, you could have started writing, you may have something you want to write, you may be self-published or independently published, you can have a website or a blog or some other platform that you're writing on. Now that I've got 100 followers on medium.com, I'm earning money for my writing. The whole 27 cents this month, it's not a huge amount of money, but you just got to start somewhere. Uh, it's also for people who've had books that have been traditionally published, because we all know the publisher's job is to get the book out there. It's not necessarily to do all of the marketing. So uh, you as an author need to be able to have some idea of how to present yourself online. It's for people with books, ebooks, audiobooks, papers, journal articles, magazines, whatever it is you've had published. Google loves content that is by someone. So journalists are always looking for what's called bylines, which just means that they wrote the article by Sue Elson. So what I've done with all of the content that I write, whichever publication I put it on, is I always write by Sue Elson. And the good news is once you have an ISBN publication, so it could be a 10 page ebook and you'll have to buy an ISBN number, but once you've done that, you have the potential to have an author profile on Google. And Google will put your content above somebody who does not have an author profile. So if you need some more help on that, please message me later and I will give you some further instructions. This workshop is also suitable for publishers, advisors, agents, professional association members, you name it. And there's an article that if you Google LinkedIn for authors, this article at the bottom of this screen will come up in search results and it goes through a few tips different to what I'm discussing today, uh, but definitely worth you checking out. So why even bother with LinkedIn? That's, you know, the operative question. Well, you will be Googled. So if somebody likes your work, they're going to Google you and decide, well, publisher will have to make sure you've got an identity before they'll consider taking on your book. Also, a literary agent might want to know a little bit more about you, not just your Facebook page that was created five years ago to look at photos of your friends and family. I mean, that's not really a, an online identity. Obviously, your readers, your employers, fellow students that you've studied with, friends, peers in the industry, people you work with, recruiters, if they're you know, looking for you to write something, um, disgruntled family members who, you know, want to backstab you in some way. Oh, the best part of putting your story online is it's your story and then you don't have to repeat it. Neighbours, basically anybody you meet, even people at parties will Google you. And the benefit of having a LinkedIn profile where you've changed the URL, and I'll show you how to do that, is you will come up in search results. So that's why you want to have this filled in. My own website, sueelson.com. I published that in 2012. And just this week, I Googled myself when I was in Sydney and my LinkedIn profile still came up before my own website. And I update my website frequently. I'm active on social media. I have links on other sites, but still LinkedIn comes up trumps in search before my own website. So, you know, another reason why you would consider having a LinkedIn profile. Uh, there's the, the link again to creating your own website on business.google.com and there's now 830 million members worldwide and over 17 million. I have to update this part of my slides. So yes, there's even more people. The other interesting thing is the level of engagement. So that's people who log on to LinkedIn and check out what's happening has increased by over 50% in the last two years. So whilst a lot of people are spending well, a lot of young people are spending a lot of time on TikTok right now. There's still more people engaging with LinkedIn than there have in the past. I also believe that no job or enterprise is forever. So my ultimate goal is to be a writer mostly full time or, you know, 80% of my time. 
and 20% I'll still do consulting and teaching and other bits and bobs looking after my clients, my, my long-standing clients who never want me to leave. Um, but that's the goal. I'm moving towards writing. And I always kind of plan ahead. So this is the benefit of having this LinkedIn profile. You've got that network and you can reconnect at any time. It also means that if something tricky happens, you can reach out to your network and those people who know, like, and trust you can potentially lead you on to other opportunities. So let's go through the top 10 techniques for authors and give yourself a big tick if you are actually doing any of these. And if not, say, well done for turning up because you're learning how to do them. So from now on, I really want you to connect with your audience. Anybody who reaches out, your advisors, your agents, your publishers, bookshops, any distribution channels, the people you deal with there, your raving fan advocates who wave the flag for you whenever they go out and about and say, love your work, your author association, your publishing association, if you're a part of that, if you're a publisher, your peers, other writers in the same genre. You might say, why would I connect with another fantasy writer? Well, your fantasy could be different to somebody else's fantasy. And, or even if it's similar, people who like that genre may also like your genre. And you can get lots of ideas. So in the old days of the old world, everybody kept their cards very close to their chest. But in the online world, the more often we're connected to other people of a similar nature, the more likely we all are to benefit because a database or an online system requires more connections. So if there are more connections between people who do the same thing, that's better. So for example, if you end up seeing my messages while I'm on LinkedIn, I've been joined up with a group of other LinkedIn specialists here in Australia by a person in Perth, Jo Saunders, and she's identified us as the people who are really good at LinkedIn and we're all supporting one another and encouraging one another in the news that we share. So we actually learn off each other. It's a fantastic thing. And because we're in the online world, we understand this kind of reciprocity. Whereas traditional publishing was, you know, have to be exclusive, nobody else can see it, all that kind of thing. And I work also on the principle is I love to write. So I want people to read my work, which is why I have started already publishing my poems online, not just leaving them all for my printed book, because I want to get that audience, I want to get Google search results. So you can connect with individual people, you can follow the company pages. So you could look at author associations worldwide and follow their pages and get insights about how they advise their members. You can find more people through something called a Google advanced search. So if you click on that link there, you can look for fantasy writer and a location and then look at the website linkedin.com and you can find anybody in that genre in your location. So all really great ways to find people to connect with. You can also add the details of your writing to several sections on your LinkedIn profile. So here's a little screenshot in the publication section of my website, I've just included my books and the fact that I answer questions on Cora.com. I'm not listing every single piece of content that I get published because there's too many. I do have a publications page on my sueelson.com website, which lists everything I've had published. It also links to the archive.org version of them. So um, every time I get something online, I copy the link, paste it over at archive.org slash web. And that means even if the publication removes that content, there will always be a record of it at archive.org. So I'm excited about that. My writing will outlive me many, many times over. Um, so there's a featured section. So if you've just below your face and your headline and stuff, you can see that there. You can add it as a media item. So you can, in the contact information section, you can link to your website or Goodreads profile or your Amazon profile. You can enter, if you've entered any writing competitions and you've become either a winner or a finalist, you could pop that in your honours and awards section on LinkedIn. And if you work for a publisher, you might even say, or you know, you've written a number of books with a publisher, you could say you're, you're an author at that publisher. So that promotes your publisher and obviously it gives you a bit more credibility to say, well, you know, you've been working with this publisher for many years and it's like a job listing 
on your LinkedIn profile. This link here is also giving you instructions on how to tell Google where you are online. So I really encourage you to consider um, following the instructions there so that when people Google your name, all your publications can pop up. Now, customizing your URL. This will optimize your name in Google search results. So I am going to flick out of the slides here and show you where this is. So you visit your LinkedIn profile. And if you haven't done this, the LinkedIn URL up the top of your screen will be something like first name dash last name dash numbers and letters. So that's just the standard one that LinkedIn has given you. But the goal is to personalize it. And you can see here, I've got mine, just my name or one word. So you go over here to edit public profile and URL. And if you've got a really common name, that may not be available. So no problem. Uh, what you can do is you can put a dash. So we click on this pen here and you can put a dash in there. And if that's not available, you can perhaps put a number on the end or you might even want to put the word author. Uh, you know, it's up to you. But you do need to personalise it and then save it. That can then be put on your email signature. It can be put on your business card. It can be put on your resume. It can be put in your book, you know, wherever you like. Uh, but personalising that URL is definitely important, okay? So we'll go back to the slides. That's why I absolutely wanted you to know about that one. Now, your headline. Your headline is directly underneath your name. And I have something called a little headline formula because when people see me in the news feed on LinkedIn, like they log in and there's that news feed in the middle of the screen, I want them to remember what it is that I do. So whilst I'm still using LinkedIn predominantly to secure work as a LinkedIn specialist, I've decided that my name is going to be, or label is going to be independent LinkedIn specialist. When I'm ready to say I'm a poetry author or a writer or something or other else, then I'll change it. But what I have also done afterwards is I've put in a bunch of keywords so that I can still be found for author or writer or whatever, and also poet. And then at the end, I've put in something about me personally. So I'm a woman over a certain age, 56 in case you need to know. And the reason I've put in that I'm a dancer is, and my dancing is very bad on my dad, but it's because I'm still active. I don't want people to think that I'm sitting on the couch watching television. Uh, I actually want people to know I'm alive and with it and keeping myself up to date by including one emoji, not too many, because then I look a little bit like a tryhard. So here's another version. You've got 220 characters to fill in this uh, description about yourself as a headline. So you could be an aspiring romantic fiction author. If you're not one yet, you can say aspiring, or you could say, your historical romantic fiction, if you know that's the type of writing that you do. So every time people see you, they know what you're about. Now with Liliane, she's a writer of many different types. So she could write author and writer first, and then she could put in all those genres afterwards as keywords. And then we've got in here a little interest surfer. So that's it another way. So that headline formula, if you wanna have some more instructions on that, you can just follow that little link there. The next thing on your phone, you can add the LinkedIn app. And what I encourage you to do there is to add a little video next to your face and next to your name, you can do a little audio pronunciation of your voice. So what this shows is that you have digital competency. So digital literacy means you have a LinkedIn profile, but digital competency means you're actually using the features that are on the platform. So I really encourage you to do that. And then there's the featured section. So every time I launch a book, I do a little intro video of myself and I put those intro videos in my featured section on my LinkedIn profile. Now, I am also a huge fan of joining professional associations. And I'm very excited to be a member of the Australian Society of Authors. And the benefit of being a member of the ASA is they have given me a page on their website, which is all about me. So that means that when people Google me, there's this link that comes up on the Australian Society of Authors 
um, website, which is fantastic. So if you have the option of having a profile page on your publisher's website or on your professional association, please make sure it's up to date. It's got a current photo. It's got all of your books listed, whatever it is, and make sure that's up to date. And then, of course, uh, showcase your membership on your LinkedIn profile by putting it in certifications and licenses and in the organization section and in the website links section. I'll, I'll show you that when we get back to the, the LinkedIn a little bit later. You can also think about how you want to share the details of any publications that you have. So you can write up posts. So if you click start a post, it will bring up this screen. Then if you click the three dots, it will bring up all of these options. So let's say uh, you, you're just releasing a new book and, you know, which book is this in the XYZ trilogy? And you can create a poll, first, second or third, you know, and, and see how engaged your audience is. What you can also do is add a document. So let's say you've got a nice little PowerPoint presentation that goes with your book, a little sort of media kit for your book. If you save that PowerPoint presentation as a PDF, which is all available within PowerPoint, you don't need a special program, you just choose save as and choose PDF. You can add that as a document on LinkedIn. And what people can do is they can go click, click, click through the different pages of that presentation or that PDF file, which can be in either portrait or landscape mode. And people can interact with your little, you know, booklet, I suppose, of what your book's about. So they can also download it. They can see it large on their screen. It gives them a lot more information. The Australian Publishers Association, uh, for what they do when they're releasing books, is they actually create a little animation. So that would be like adding a video, and you might want to put an animation out on your social media. But this link here talks about how to engage, curate, and create content for LinkedIn if you're a very busy person. So don't think that you always have to be producing content. The social media platforms love it when you engage with other people's stuff. And Dave's very good at that. He's often engaging with his author's content and sharing it, which means curating. So he gets his author's content and he shares it through his profile, so it's curating. And then obviously your own content that you can create. And as I said, please put your questions in the chat. I'm happy to answer those at any stage. Now, what I've also done is I've created a company page for my name. And you might say, but Sue, you're not a company. But the benefit of doing this is, as you can see, I'm only one employee there, but I've got 515 followers. And what I also love about this is that when I publish content under my name, it gets lost in the LinkedIn newsfeed and only lasts there a couple of days. But when I put it on my company page, it stays there today, tomorrow, next week, next month, you know, it's visible for at least 12 months. So that's much better value for me. So every time I post as a person, I also post on my Sue Elson company page. And there's a little link there on how to maximize your company profile. The next one is uh, number nine, to adjust any settings. So let's say you want to check out some literary agents. You don't want them to know that you're looking at their profile. You can just turn yourself to anonymous and you can check out as many people as you like without them knowing. But what you can also do is you can um, turn off people also viewed because you don't want somebody landing on your LinkedIn profile and then disappearing and not appearing on, you know, the other profiles, uh, so go, going off to other people's profiles. What you can also do is turn on creator mode. And then what this does is it changes your big blue connect button to a follow button. So if you're an influencer, you have more followers than connections. And what it also means is you can put five hashtags on your LinkedIn profile. So then a hashtag is just a topic. So if I do hashtag fantasy fiction in my content that I share on LinkedIn, and it's one of my creator content hashtags as well, then my content is likely to go further because I've already nominated it as a hashtag that I talk about on a regular basis. Um, you can also turn off autoplay videos and you can also decide, you know, what public profile settings you want. 
this little session here uh, was a recording of a webinar I did for uh, Kenneth Lang in the US, in New Jersey. And uh, it was all about LinkedIn for creators. So if you want to check that out and learn more about creator mode, um, you can definitely watch that webinar. Now, these statistics, are, uh, this statistics spreadsheet, I should say, is available via my website at the latest offer link there. But these are some of the statistics that you can keep on your LinkedIn profile. So here's what they were on the 10th of May. And it tells you how to get the statistic by following the link. And then the goal is for you to just write down these numbers at different dates. So the next date I do it, you know, it might be the 10th of July. And then I can get all my numbers and compare it. And this gives me a little bit of a clue as to what is working for me. So that's another option as well. So now we're going to look at 10 ways to use LinkedIn for authors. As I said before, LinkedIn doesn't just want you to post, 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 buy my book, buy my writing, you know, check me out online. It wants you to listen as well. So when you hover over the like button, you'll see that there's these different types of reactions you can make. I like the clapping one. I think it's nicer than the, the thumbs up. This one means that you're offering support to the person. Now, you might have noticed on LinkedIn more recently, there's a lot of posts about people's mental health or the challenges they've faced or they've lost their a dear loved one. And a lot of people use this emoji to support the person. And it seems that the LinkedIn algorithm is favoring those posts. So I seem to be seeing a lot of them. Not a huge fan of them, I have to say. Uh, but just to let you know, that's probably why you're seeing it. Also, the love heart is great. Good idea. This one means curious. I find it somewhat passive aggressive. I'm not a fan of that one. Um, you know, I'd rather sort of just like it and then perhaps make a relevant comment. The longer the comments are, the better that is for the person who published that piece. So just keep that in mind as well. Uh, Jim's asked, are the stats available only to premium subscribers? No, all the stats listed on that spreadsheet you can get as a free member. Uh, the premium allows you to see the last 90 days of people who've looked on your LinkedIn profile. Um, so you won't be able to see the people, but you'll still see the number of views you've had. So that, that number is still there. Does LinkedIn penalise you for copying across an article you post under your name to your company page? Not to my knowledge. I, when I write an article on LinkedIn, I could write it under my personal profile or my company profile. I did put one out under my company profile and it absolutely tanked. It got nowhere. So I've decided to keep publishing under my personal profile. But what I notice is when I write up the little post that goes out with the article I've just written, it doesn't go very well. So at the same time I publish the article, you know, just through the normal process, I actually create a new post on LinkedIn and I I send out details of my article. That post goes uh, very well. Oh, good to hear you've had the same experience, Jacqueline. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> we, we're sharing the, the same thing. It's amazing how often Jim's got the same. Yeah. So it is worth making a separate post every time you write an article. Now, moz.com, uh, which is all about search engine optimization, they have said that LinkedIn is one of the top 10 places in the world to publish your content. Now, if any of you've heard of search engine optimization, I do SEO my LinkedIn articles. I put great headlines. I put lots of subheadlines throughout my article. I put lists, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I put quotes. I put bold text. I put links. I put pictures. I put, you know, calls to action. I do all of these things every time I write an article. So the benefit of that is that my articles can appear in Google search results. So that, and that works forever, you know, like I've got a number of them that are number one page one of Google and have been since like 2017, um, which is pretty cool. Five years worth of views um, and number one page one of Google. I think that's a pretty good uh, return on investment. Now, obviously, Google does not like you to have duplicate content. So if you are public, if you are writing a blog on your website and then you wanted to share it as an article on LinkedIn, 
I would actually suggest that you make it about 30% different because that way the piece on your website and the LinkedIn article could both be indexed in Google search results. Now, the other thing that you'll notice here, this was a really interesting post that I made. There's no links to an external website. So LinkedIn likes it because I'm not taking people off the platform. But I had this class and there was a student in the class. It was all about websites. And she was trying to do business with China. And they said, we're not prepared to do business with you until you fix up your website. And she said, well, what's wrong with my website? And they said, well, you've got black and white photos of your staff on the website. And they said, well, what's wrong with that? And apparently in China, black and white photographs are used on gravestones. So this Chinese company thought that all the staff were dead, which is obviously not a good look. So I prepared an image with me in black and white and colour. This is my 2016 image, by the way. And I put this up as a post. Now, when people are scrolling through the news feed, if they like it, that's great. If they comment, even better. But if they stop moving their mouse or their finger, the algorithm can detect that somebody is looking at something for a long period of time. Now, the benefit of the before and after, like this could be you writing you know, a book and then this could be writing on a computer or, I don't know, any sort of cross-comparison, People are natural, and if it's got a face on it, people are naturally inclined to look at it. So believe it or not, this has got 170 something um, reactions, 64 comments, but it had 32,000 views, right? So some people say, which book cover do you like? This one or this one? So they sort of look similar, but different. So these types of posts can actually be really good for authors to get people to sort of pause as they're scrolling through and to get people to engage with your content. Then if LinkedIn recognises you as a good quality content producer, then that is obviously going to help you as well so that when you do post, it's more likely to go viral. I would also recommend that if you are working with a publisher, you might be under some special arrangements but you need to give them some content that they can share. And lots of people love those behind the scenes photographs. Where do you write? How do you write? You know, all of those kind of stories are really interesting. So please keep the social media team informed, provide good quality photos and text that goes with it. And also, yeah, there's this article here. If you would like to learn some more tips on how to make a LinkedIn post go viral. Now, when I went to get a professional photograph, the professional photographer took 70 photos before they took a good one. Now, my brother's been in the Navy and he was taught that if you can't tie knots, tie lots. So I apply this philosophy to photographs. So I was speaking at an event last Tuesday night and I was in a group photo with other people who were there and other speakers and so on. And I got the person to take multiple photos. I think he took at least 15 photos. And believe it or not, only one of those photos was any good to be put on social media. So from now on, don't worry about, you know, your technique. Just take lots of photos and hopefully one of them will be useful and you can use it on social media and keep your network alive and knowing what you're up to. Now, the other thing you can do is there's a lot of other features on LinkedIn. You can use emojis in your posts. So here you can see I've used a little tick emoji. You can use at mentions. So I've at mentioned Fueled by Growth, which was the publication for this. You can see I've got hashtags. So normally I also put hashtag Sue Elson in my posts. I've obviously forgot on this one, um, but you can definitely consider doing that. You can add your videos to YouTube. If you add the video to YouTube, YouTube will create a transcript. So I like to edit it because they normally call me Sir Wilson instead of Sue Elson. Must be my Australian accent. And then I download that transcription. I put it in the description of the video. And it also means when I publish the video on LinkedIn or Facebook or somewhere else using my laptop or desktop, then I can upload that transcript. So it means all my videos have captions on them. So it means that anyone can watch my videos or hear my videos by you know seeing those captions there so I definitely encourage you to do that 
Most of you would have found out about this particular event via a LinkedIn event. So you can invite 1,000 people a week. So my last book, I did an online launch. So the benefit of doing an online launch of a book is you can invite people from anywhere in your country or the world to your book launch. Now, what you could also do is sell tickets. And if you sell the tickets and include the price of the book, you've also made a whole bunch of book sales. So that's another option. You can create LinkedIn newsletters, polls, as I mentioned, and you can also share your publicity. Um, is There's a question here. Is the YouTube link better or worse than uploading the video to LinkedIn? So what I'm suggesting, Dave, is with every video, put all your videos on YouTube, regardless of where else you post them. After it's on YouTube, you get that SRT file, the, the transcript. Then when you go to social media, you upload the video directly into social media because social media does not want somebody going off to YouTube and leaving the social media platform. And when you upload it into LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever, you upload that SRT file at the same time. Now, if you do this on your company page, you also end up with a little videos tab and it puts all the videos that you've ever produced in that one spot. Now, let's say it's, you know, 4.05 p.m. and you've got to, you know, do something with children after school and you've, you know, got no time to spare and you don't have time to upload the native video, put the darn, uh, you know, YouTube link in. <laughs> That's good. Oh, Jim's got a good point. LinkedIn is limited to 10-minute videos or used to be. Uh, yes, obviously you can't have like an hour and a half video <laughs> uploaded to LinkedIn. The reality is, Jim, most people will not watch a video that long anyway on LinkedIn. So I'd suggest if you did have a piece of video content you want to add, it would be under three minutes. And the reality is if your video is not watched for three seconds or more, it's not classified as even being watched and it won't go viral either. I'm noticing most people who put videos on social media now are doing them under 30 seconds. Now, apparently, most of the people on TikTok are under the age of 25, and the most popular videos on TikTok are between 15 and 45 seconds. And the videos that go, and I found this out from somebody at TikTok, I was listening to a webinar recently, the most popular videos are watched for at least 30 seconds. So if you've got a 15 to 45 second video and it's watched either for the, all of the video or up to 30 seconds, it pretty much will go viral. So I'm actually considering in the future doing more of this short form content rather than these long webinar sessions. So watch out, folks. You may be seeing more video content from me on social media. And yes, Dave, you're right. You use YouTube to get the transcript and the SRT caption file, and then you upload the video and the SRT file into LinkedIn. Absolutely. And if you can do it on the company page as well as your personal profile, woohoo, that's fantastic. Um, so glad you've got that tip out of there. So I also recommend that you update your LinkedIn profile every year. A lot can change in a year. Like, in the moment, it doesn't feel like it. But when you look back, you realize, oh, my goodness, I've done this and I've done that over the year. Most of us underestimate what we can achieve in a year and overestimate what we can do in a week. So please, you know, go out for that broader range and make sure you update your LinkedIn profile. You also, if there's people that you love their work, so you've got a favorite person at your publishing company or another author you love or something like that, I've got a person I know who's a former journalist and a member of a professional association. I love his work. So I visited Warren's profile and I've clicked the notification bell. So that means most of his content I will actually see. So if you like the content I share, please click on the notification bell on my personal profile and then you too are more likely to receive notifications of when I publish. You can also go and try and add connections. So on your mobile phone, in the LinkedIn app, what you can do is you can press inside the search box and then you can press scan and you can 
obviously when you're out and about in person is you can connect with people just using your phone. So it means you don't have to carry a business card. It means you don't have to type their number into your device. You don't have to swap email addresses. And if their email address changes, it doesn't matter because you can still message them directly on LinkedIn. So from now on, everyone you meet personally or professionally, I encourage you to connect with them on LinkedIn. Please let me know, yes, you're getting value out of this webinar. Just pop it in the chat if you're finding it helpful. Now, if you can't remember that sort of quick instruction I gave you, these are the steps. So you open the LinkedIn app, you press in the search box up the top here, you press the little dots, and then you press um, uh, scan to make sure you've got the camera enabled and you turn on the settings to make sure it's turned on. This is for the iPhone, but it would be similar in an Android. Then you've got your little code there. And when, you, when somebody scans the code, there'll either be a blue follow or connect button, a message in the three dots. Oh, thank you, Sam, love your work. That's terrific, thank you. Um, so you don't press the follow button, you press the three dots. And then what you can do is you can personalize the invite. So if we're both at a function and we can say, nice to meet you at the XYZ event, let's connect and you send off the invitation. So what that means is when they go back to their phone later or their laptop or desktop computer, they can say, oh, that was Sue that I met at the event. And they'll say, yep, I will connect. It also means like I've been doing some work for the Australian Institute of Management over the last four days. So I say, nice to meet you at AIM. That means I can search through all my messages to anybody I met at AIM. And it means that I can track those people down. Also, if you go out to an event, Mike, I suggest you try and meet at least three people. Mike, two questions you should ask are, how did you find out about this event? And my second question is, what keeps you busy during the day? Not what do you do? Where do you live? What car do you drive? Where did you buy those shoes from? I mean, they're all stupid questions if you ask me. But how did you find out about the event? What keeps you busy during the day? Oh, that sounds fantastic. Would you like to connect on LinkedIn? And uh, then the following day, you can look on your My Network tab on LinkedIn and then you can reconnect with all of those people that you met the next day. The biggest complaint I hear is people getting invites to connect without any messages. Write those messages. Yes, Jim, that's very true. A lot of people say, if somebody doesn't write me a personal message, then I will not connect with them. I'm not like that. I, I do accept, you know, unpersonalized requests to connect, but I do always look at the person's profile. And if I think they're just going to sell to me or they're going to annoy me and they don't have many connections or they're in some foreign country doing something completely unrelated to what I do, then I choose not to connect with them. Now, interestingly, Jim, I am part of sort of a brain's trust of LinkedIn people all over the world. And some people have done some research. And what they found is there's about the same connection rate between personalized messages and non-personalized messages. Now, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if somebody says a personalized message, hi, my name's Mark and I love everything you've written on your LinkedIn profile and I think that we would be a great fit and I'd like to talk about how we can work together in the future, which sounds like the most common repeat message sent to multiple people, I'd be very concerned about what Mark's trying to do. So unless the message is really, really tailored specifically for me, Sue, uh, I attended your LinkedIn for Authors event, love your work, shall we connect? Then I'll say, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's no issue. I would connect with that person. But some sort of generic message that is faux personalised, you know, not really personalised, but tries to look personalised. Um, yeah, have a find, find a way to connect. Absolutely. Look at my profile. Like, don't message me and say, what's your email address? as an example, because my email address is written on my LinkedIn profiles. There's no reason for them to even ask me that question. So yeah, um, thank you for your engagement there, Jim. Another way to use LinkedIn is to set some goals. Who do you want to connect with? Who do you want to reach? And what you can do is there's an option on your main page to say open to. So it might be open to work, open to providing services and open to hiring someone. 
So if you choose open to providing services, you can fill out this little services page and, whoops, sorry, you can add media as well. So you can put copies of your books or your launches or something or another else. So you've got eight little images that you can share on this page. Now, the beauty of this is if somebody goes searching on LinkedIn for people who offer writing and you've got a services page, then voila, you could appear in search results. If you are part of a publisher, they may have some social media guidelines that you have to abide by. So please make sure you're aware of their social media policy. Please make sure that you follow your publisher on all of their socials, on their Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Google Business, you know, write them a review, do all of these things. Keep yourself connected to anybody that you are associated with. Also, as I've discussed, write some articles. They can remain online indefinitely, but please always keep a backup. I stupidly answered 160 odd questions on Cora.com and apparently I was outside of their rules. I mean, I did exactly what I'd seen everybody else do, mind you. So they deleted like 140 of those items. And because I didn't have any record, all that content disappeared. So what I usually do is before I hit the publish button, I copy paste whatever I've written and I email it to myself. So I've always got a copy of anything I've written. Sometimes I'm a bit more organized and put a copy on my cloud account, but not always, but at least I've got an email version of it. So the other thing I do as soon as I've published something, I put a the copy of the link and put it in archive.org slash web. Now this article you may even wanna read should you pay for social media ads, because a lot of people think I'll just sell my books if I have ads. You know, I don't have to fix my website. I don't have to have a sales funnel. I don't have to have a shop. I'll just pay for ads and I'll magically sell books. Well, I'm here to tell you there's a few things you should do before you go down that path. And if you are going to spend money on ads, in particular LinkedIn ads, absolutely you need to speak to an expert before you start spending money on it. I'd also like you to consider bringing your artistic flair to LinkedIn. Sometimes LinkedIn is just a little bit dry and boring. So if you can bring in a little bit of your personality, I'd love to see it. But also do not be duped into paying for any sort of automation because that is against the LinkedIn user agreement. And you really do need to make sure that you follow the LinkedIn user agreement. There's a section in there called do's and don'ts. It does, it's not very long, so make sure you at least read section eight um, so that you know what you are or are not allowed to do on LinkedIn. So how can you do all of this stuff in 20 minutes a week? Well, obviously updating your LinkedIn profile may take longer than uh, 20 minutes. In fact, I usually suggest up to 10 hours. So, and look, if you don't do anything from this webinar within three days, you won't do anything. So please make a little commitment to yourself to do something within the next three days. And, um, oh, Lillian's put a post in here. Very generous with your content, very thorough. She's wondering if anyone here is interested in buddying up for a short time to implement those strategies so the two of you can work together. Great offer there, Lillian. So if anybody would like to do that, Lillian, you might like to copy paste your LinkedIn URL into the chat so that people can visit your profile and connect if they would like to do that. Um, so what would you do if you just had 20 minutes a week? You've updated your profile, you've implemented all these strategies. Here's what you would do. You would log in and engage with the news feed. And I'd suggest that takes about eight minutes. I would suggest you like at least three things and write at least one comment. You would look at your notifications and see whether there's anything you'd like to engage with. You'd look at who your who has invited themselves to connect with you and any event invitations or newsletter subscriptions and just review those. You would look at the content of your employer or publisher or, you know, anybody you're associated with and engage with their content to support their content, even their other authors, you know, why not? Um, edit or update your own profile or settings if something has changed. Pop an item into the news feed that you've either found from somewhere else in a sharing or you've created yourself and reflect on your statistics and activity and make plans for next week. If you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter with those updates, you're welcome to do that as well. 
So uh, we're nearly at the end and more questions will be coming. So where do you go to from here? So as I said at the beginning, you can um, see more information on my website under publications. You can see other videos I've done. The next event in this series is, is going to be LinkedIn for Women at midday on the 13th of July. You can see other presentations I'm doing in this year uh, on that link. And if you'd like to hire me to help you with something or help two people at a time, um, it's 175 Australian dollars per hour, including GST or no GST if you're from overseas. And it can be recorded so you can replay it if I'm a little bit too quick. Um, so you're most welcome to consider that as well. These are the previous ones that I've run. So there's the LinkedIn for creatives. So if you want to check out the recording, you can definitely do that. The presentation should have already been emailed through to you. Um, if you haven't got it, because uh, that was, it said, here's the link for today's webinar and it had the presentation attached. If you haven't got it, just contact me via LinkedIn or email and I'll definitely email it out to you. Um, it will also, it's also on my website, suewelson.com slash blog. It's the latest blog. So the slides are there too, if you want to download it directly off the website. Right now, it's there. Um, so you're welcome to do that. So after LinkedIn for Women, we're doing students and future graduates, tradespeople, career changers, salespeople, migrants, expats, and so on. As I said at the beginning, you can download my first four books for free from ResearchGate. The links are on that link there. And you can follow me on your favourite social media. If you like poetry, definitely recommend that you follow me on Instagram because that's where I, uh, you know, just publish my poems. So how can you say thank you? Well, if you're connected with me, you can write a recommendation. Or if you've got a Gmail email address or a Google account, you can literally click on that link and pop in a review. So as I said, LinkedIn for Creatives, I've got five reviews. I was so excited. There's currently 108 listed there. So if you've got a moment, or you can just scan that little QR code right now from your screen and you can quickly pop in a review, mention what was helpful to you. That would be wonderful. And also, often when you are a writer or an artist or you're creative of some sort, everybody wants you to do stuff for free. How annoying is it? Can you just do this for me? It won't take you long, but I can't write or whatever. So the next time somebody does that, I invite you to get them to say, I'm happy to help, but before I help you, I want you to read this article. Sorry, we don't have a budget for that. So they want you to do something for nothing, but they don't have a budget. Well, believe it or not, there are many things that people can offer you in exchange for your time or capability. So likewise, if you need to ask for something for free, why don't you read the article and say, look, Unfortunately, I don't have a budget for it, but here's what I can offer you in exchange. So you might want to write them a review. You might want to give them an introduction. You might want to make some suggestions based on your area of expertise. You might want to do a book review for them. You know, there's all sorts of things that you can do. But please don't ask people all the time for something for nothing um, because it takes most of us many, many years and a lot of hours to acquire our skills. And so, yeah, I really like to encourage people to say thank you and also to always offer something in exchange. So we've got lots of lovely comments in the chat about being practical and useful. How do I deal with troll reviews? Okay, well, I'm reasonably fortunate in that I've only had one negative review and it was somebody who said my 120 ways to achieve your purpose with LinkedIn was too technical and I should have pictures. And I'm thinking, it's 120 ways to achieve your purpose. It's not LinkedIn for dummies. But even still, I chose to respond in a positive manner. Thank you for your feedback. Uh, I chose with this book to focus on strategies and the book is really written for people who already have a LinkedIn profile or understanding it. So you can respond politely. You can ignore them. So if you want to check out some of the content that where I've been quoted on the Daily Mail website. So if you go to Daily Mail and you look for Sue Elson, you'll see the troll comments that I've received there. Is Sue's photograph pre or post lobotomy? 
if I look like Sue Elson, can I get a job too? Um, you know, I think she looks like Matt Lucas or something or another, like horrid, horrid, horrid things. So I asked the journalist who quoted me what I should do in response to these, you know, trolls, and they said, ignore it. And what I tell myself is somebody who's trolling me, they're not published, they're not quoted, they're not helping somebody, they're not providing entertainment, they're just trolling. So I actually feel sorry for those people because the only way they can get published is they hate on someone else. So it really depends on the nature of the person, you know, or the publication as to how much trolling you might get. So the other strategy is, is this Google review strategy. So I have asked hundreds and hundreds of students over many, many years to write me reviews, and I've got 108. But the benefit of having 108 good ones is that when I get a bad one on Google, I've got 108 good ones. Now, not, I'm not going to appeal to everyone all the time, so I've got to develop a thick skin on that. But it's a lot easier if I've got good ones out there already. I uh, had a competitor leave a one-star Google review of my book. took me three months to get Google to remove it. The competitor then just left it again under a new name. Well, that's sour grapes, isn't it? I'm really sorry to hear that. I, As I said, try and ignore these people and focus on what you can do. Um, I had one client who had a disgruntled client who wrote them a bad review, which was unjustified. And because I reported it, because I had already written a review for my client, it had a swear word in it and Google were very good at removing it quickly. But most of the time, it's extremely difficult to get Google reviews removed. So on my YouTube videos, I make sure that every video I upload, a comment cannot appear under my YouTube video unless it's been approved by me. So that's a strategy I have for YouTube. Some people on Facebook will also turn off their reviews because the only people who write reviews for like a government body are why do you charge so much for what you offer, you know, so that's pointless having reviews there. But unfortunately, you cannot turn off Google reviews. So my risk management strategy is get good reviews so that when the, the idiot competitor or the troll or anybody else writes bad stuff, you can say, you know, sorry, we don't have any record of you purchasing the book or, you know, um, whatever. It's a strategy because Google gives primacy to their own reviews, so it comes up first. Yes. Now, the other thing is, because I've written reviews, Google invited to me to be a local guide, right? So now every time I sign in and write a Google review, I earn points, particularly if I add photographs at the same time. So some of my photos, would you believe, have had over 2 million views on Google. And because I'm a local guide, my reviews appear at the top of the list. So when you Google my clients, my reviews are often the first review that people see. And then they say, oh, who is this Sue Elson? And because Google sees that I write reviews as well as receive reviews, that helps my reviews go up to the top of the list as well. So if you read a good book, find the author, write them a review, you know, like, it's a lonely job being a writer and we don't always get a lot of feedback. So if you if something good happens or you like something, don't just write a review when something terrible happens, write a review when something good happens. It is really, really worthwhile. So that's the end of the slides. Um, so now what I'll do is I'll just open to general questions. Feel free to turn on your camera if you want more of an engaging experience. Thank you for joining us. It's just gone one o'clock, so that's the official hour. Nice to see you back, Trevor. Did you get as much out of this one as the last one? I mean, yeah, I, I loved it. Um, you're very generous. I, I see that comment from someone else. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I felt like my hand's been held yet again. I'll probably Good. need it again. Thank you. <laughs> You're most welcome. And thank you for turning up again. You know, a lot of people say they'll come back and then they don't. And, you know, it's so nice to meet people who are, uh, you know, true to their words. So thank you for, for turning up. That's terrific. Um, Ken said, could you please recap your view on what to post on your LinkedIn page versus your LinkedIn company page and when to repost from one to the other? Okay, Ken, my usual logic is publish first and usually publish on my website. Then my goal is to publish on my personal uh, profile, on LinkedIn profile, and on my company 
profile. I, so I posted on both. Now, where there may have been a little bit of confusion today is when you write an article on LinkedIn. So an article stays there. It doesn't just go in the newsfeed. Now, when you publish an article, you can publish it under your name or you can publish it under your company page. But when the article is published, LinkedIn says, would you like to write a post? And you write that post, but it doesn't go anywhere. Nobody ends up seeing it. So when I write the article on LinkedIn, I also do a new post to both my personal profile and my company page, which says, here's an article I've just written on LinkedIn. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And anybody else like to unmute and say what's been most helpful to them from today as well? Uh, MA Demers, I appreciate this. I have to leave to attend a family and go through the slides and implementing your recommendations. Yes, see if you can do it within three days because then it will happen. Um, and feel free to reconnect with Lilian as well if you'd like to do that. Yes. Yeah, it was so you were great. And I haven't done what you told me last time. Um, That's but all right. I made a great reminder and the slides are going to be fantastic to yes. go through when I've got a chance to you know I'm sorry I missed the beginning I rushed in and anyway but you're it'll very be on generous. YouTube later okay. today all good yeah and thank you for turning up you know like some people think oh well I didn't do it and I shouldn't go but no you still turned up so give yourself a pat on the no, back because I want to, I did a couple of the things you said no because I wanted to do it and you said to me you know just do 10 minutes at a time I've just had a silly life but I'm but this has sort of reinvigorated me. That's what's Good. lovely. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Well done. Anybody? Oh, Lilian. So I just wanted to share a, a, an experience I've just had where someone contacted me. They they sent me a beautiful, authentic message on LinkedIn saying that they had um, been, they were looking at uh, for authentic coaches, yes. you know, and they perceived that I was an authentic coach. Yeah. And he had this, you know, he was offering this um, opportunity where he was going to set up a, a system whereby he would find all the business and you'd be his talent, you know, that, you know, his, his coaches kind of thing. Yes. And, um, and so there was this great income potential and all the rest of it. Anyway, yeah. so I had a meeting with him and, you know, he sounded genuine and it sounded like there might be potential in it. But what ends up happening is in the very first conversation, he was saying, um, I'm not going to charge anyone for this, I don't think. And then in the next session, you know, the, the, the dollars, oh. you know, what he was going to charge, the fee he was going to charge for all of this. And then finally I wrote back to him and said, I'm not interested on, on your um, the, yes. the terms Offer. you're offering. I'm, I'd propose these terms. Never heard from him again. So all that genuine authenticity, and I care, and I wanted this, and I'm going to be we're going to be different coaches, and you know all that just, you know, interesting. Yeah. So I just yeah. wanted to share because you know. Thank you, there are And and the problem is um, something like LinkedIn is a bit of a. We know we need to do it, but where do we start, and who can we trust? And you know, a lot of people want to get you into. Uh, so the best business model is a retainer because that means every month you're going to get some sort of return. So that's why there's this software as a service because they don't just sell you once and it's a lifetime subscription. They sell you a monthly fee, so then they've got a regular income. But I believe the most honest and ethical approach is to pay by the hour because you know you've got the hour with that person and you know it's up to you whether you continue or not so you don't have to sign up for the three thousand dollar program but interestingly my daughter was uh looking at a specialist program i won't say on what topic but somebody told her it would be i think it was fifteen hundred dollars plus the product that you had to purchase that went with you know this particular program and she almost fell for it because it was like a one-figure amount, right? So she knew up front it was going to be $1,500 plus the cost of the product. And I said to her, but if you just paid by the hour to somebody you already know who does that, you can get through a lot of sessions for the same price. But because people don't know how long is a piece of string, you know, they don't mm. do it. So I recommend if you're ever considering going to get advice from anyone, you check them out online, do all your due diligence, and then you book an hour with them and decide whether, you know, that was worth it. 
and then you can make a, a good decision on whether it's worth continuing or not. So I encourage people to pay that premium up front rather than the free, you know, one hour session or whatever it is. And then you get signed up to some ridiculous price thing or ongoing commitment that you can't maintain, you know, after that. I got sucked into an $800, like it was really sneaky. It was an Australian and they said it was $500. But then when you booked it, it was 500 US dollars. So it ended up being like $800. And then I started watching the videos and they drove me nuts. So I spent $800 and I haven't done the course. So yeah, we've got to be careful about how we do these things. So look at the free stuff, get yourself a little bit of knowledge, do your due diligence and then pay for an hour and go from there. Because I'm sure that there would have been quite a lot you could have got in an hour session if you just paid for that. Hmm. Mm. I might not have explained it entirely clearly, but anyway, it, it, it doesn't matter. Your, your comments are, are um, certainly valid for all yeah. sorts of related. Well, look, there's, there's plenty of people out there trying to rip people off mm. and there's vanity publishers. Uh, I'm sure Dave could talk to that. You know, there's a lot of people, you pay $10,000 and you get 500 books and then you've got to buy them at full price. And, you know, you're not really a published mm. author. You're, you're, it's just vanity publishing. No. So, you know, there, there's plenty of things to watch out for. And I've listened to lots of those webinars. And that's, again, another reason why I chose to do um, independently published. So I didn't end up with those sorts of issues. Um, mm. Oh, Ken's put a coin in here. I did some of your LinkedIn on creators recommendations. I'm going to do a bunch more from this program. Woohoo! Well done, Ken. And Sarah's already mm. done a Google review. Thank you. I will make sure I respond to that today as well. Dave, you look like you're champing at the bit to have a comment there. Oh, well, not not champing, Sue, but, <laughs> but thank you again for a lovely another lovely presentation. The um, just talking to around Lillian, the conversation you and Lillian were having that I, I, I always find um, it's, not, it's a little bit like that comment from Tom, Tom Cruise. Um, can't remember which film it was now, but basically show me the, show me the money. So mm. I think what that actually means is that um, a valid question, I think, to ask anybody who's offering you something which is going to generate this massive stream of income for you is to say to them, that's absolutely fine with me. I want, I want to experience this for three months so that I know that I'm going to have that revenue that you're going to generate for me in order that I'll be able to afford to pay the charges you're going to be paying me in each of those three months. Mm. That was and essentially it, what I put to him. It, oh, that, really? Not yeah, that exactly, but it, a, something like that was what I put to him. I said, if you're so Along confident in your system, yes. let me have a trial for three months, you know, and then, and I, then if or whatever it was that I said, but it was very similar, you know, and he just I've disappeared never had... and didn't ever reply. Yeah, uh, I th and, and that's the great way to do it. I think, you know, hmm. you can't sort of um, hide under a rock and never respond to any of these ideas, hmm. but to the extent that you're tempted by them or you want to investigate them, then, hmm. you know, it's it's probably better to have gone through the process, asked those hard questions saying, well, well like, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if I have to pay you a dollar for every $10 that I earn, then I'm happy to earn those $10 from you and give you that dollar back. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to take the promise of that, but it's got actually got to be in my bank account. So when that $10 goes into my bank account, I'm more than, I'd be delighted. I'll pay you $2 for every 10 or three or four or five. But I think that challenge, that, that challenge question, um, yeah. in a hundred percent of cases I've found that the, the next result is nothing. It's just a puff of smoke and you'll hear nothing ever again because you know, mm. then you know exactly. what you're trying to close on. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Was, we just want your money. <laughs> yeah. mm. Very good point. Sue, I'd love to give you a recommendation. What Thank do you. I say? How, how do we choose the relationship? On like, LinkedIn, uh, look, anything that sounds reasonably remotely similar. So maybe a client of mine or something like that. Okay. Is that a I'll choice still? Yeah, it is still a choice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Wendy. Sue, so I have a um, an observation. Maybe it's a question. Yes. <clears throat> because you're uh, you're obviously a, a an advanced expert, if there's such a thing, on LinkedIn. Um, yesterday, I connected with a podcaster. She's American, um, and I haven't had a real good look at it yet. But it seems to me that as an author and as a LinkedIn expert, you yes. would be ideal as a podcast host for authors. You've got a significant audience here today 124 yes. of us yes. uh, there must yes. be thousands 
Uh, yes, it would be yeah, good point. To do. Um, the challenge that we have in the online world, there, there's so many ways to share content. And as Dave, I'm sure, would attest, a podcast is a lot of work. Like, I know getting speakers, you know, getting them there on time, preparing your questions, doing your research. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people as because I've been a member of the Australian Human Resources Institute for many years and we ran the International HR Network and we'd get a panel of speakers on and I'd interview them and we'd, we'd audio record them. This is a few years ago now. And I'm very good at asking questions and also answering questions, you know, if they're related to LinkedIn. But then the problem is if you spend all that time, how do you get a return on that investment? So it, you, you've got to work out where that line is. So I did. I started these webinars in September last year. It has definitely increased the size of my network. It's definitely got me more Google reviews. I've probably got about three small clients out of it. I haven't got a huge amount of clients. I've loved the commitment it's made me have, you know, to setting dates and times and producing content around these fields. I'm finding that if you Google the topics, LinkedIn for authors, LinkedIn for journalists, you know, LinkedIn for business coaches, I'm coming up in search results. So that's fantastic. But I'm yet to get the conversion to the next stage. So that's why I'm thinking, and I'll need to do this, I'll need to review by the end of the year, you know, for the, the list I've done, what has been my return on investment, because it's a minimum of six hours work for me mm -hmm. to get the event up, to prepare the presentation, to do all the emails and the follow up and all those things. And and connect with everyone and you know there's quite a lot of work that's involved in it so unless I can prove a return on investment you know I've got to make that decision now I went to another event this morning and they said that people's attention span has dropped to the length of a TikTok video <laughs> so with that being the case you're a committed capable intellectual person who's happy to sit through an hour of Sue but not everybody is and, you know, people want sort of the 15 second grab now and they want it in video format. And in video, they also want it on their phone. So it's got to be in portrait mode. And if it's on something like TikTok, if they watch it and they don't keep scrolling, the video just keeps playing and playing and playing. So I can get like six or 10 views out of one person. Whereas if I just did a video on YouTube in landscape, I'd only get one view because then it would, you know, predict which video the person might want to watch next. So there's all these choices available to us. Now, what I can say, LinkedIn for podcasters. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Um, so I guess what we, we've got these choices as to how we share our content. And, and I follow different people on YouTube. And I'm even noticing that YouTubers are changing over to shorts, which is the TikTok version of YouTube videos. So again, a short on YouTube is filmed this way instead of this way, and it goes for a shorter period of time. And if you're watching shorts on YouTube, same thing as TikTok. They, they play over and over and over again until you move on to the next one. So because that's the trending style of content at the moment, uh, if I adopt that approach with what I'm doing and I lead people to my books or I lead people to a LinkedIn course, then that can potentially work for me. But as an ex-banker, I am risk averse and I am not prepared to try something until I can prove that it works. Now, I can prove that the webinar does X, Y and Z for me and I'm building my network and I'm building relationships and people come back. You know, that's all fabulous. And I love the relationship component. I love the fact that I get to see people on a regular basis. You know, I love all of those things. Um, but I was talking with a copywriter this morning about, you know, making it into a LinkedIn course and I believe in spreading risk. So I wouldn't rely on TikTok to be my saviour right? I still have relationships. I still go to events. I run networks. You know, I produce long form content. I do a variety of things. And another thing I'm thinking about doing is um, providing a specialist type of service to professional associations, because a lot of professional associations 
are not good at getting their members to engage on social media. So I'm thinking of offering a product to them. So that could then be my retainer revenue where the professional association only pays for the number of people who go through it and, and so on. So I've got other ideas because I've got to keep thinking about where are the trends going and how do I adapt and grow according to you know, what I can realistically maintain as an individual because I prefer to use technology-based solutions rather than labour-based solutions because I don't want to have, you know, a cast of 30 staff and overheads and all that kind of thing. So I'm always looking for the tech to do it. So I've always got my eyes and ears open thinking about is there a better way to achieve a result? Yeah. Thank you, Liliane. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, certainly. There's only one of you, unfortunately. There is only one of me. Yeah, that's right. And there's only so many hours in the day. So, yeah. And look, I love doing stuff for free. I've done stuff for free my entire working career. Um, and I often enjoy it more than the paid stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, I do need to be paid for the work I do. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're most Great. welcome, Trevor. You're welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Lindy. You're great bye to see bye. you again. You too. Bye. Thanks, Dave. Thanks so much, too. Fantastic. Really good tips on the video on LinkedIn too as well. Thank you very much for that. And I'll follow your, your next little experiment with video with interest. <laughs> so yeah, one, or two, one or two minutes of Sue, a bit of background story, a bit of fly on the wall stuff. I mean, it doesn't take I'd... long to produce and you've got the audio and the video. So, yeah, I... I I'll follow your follow your experiment with interest. Yeah, there. look, I'm I'm nervous about it, Dave, because mm. um, I'm just a nice girl from Adelaide, and I don't like to brag and boast. And I feel like a lot of video comes across as self promotion, and also yeah. if the video becomes popular, I could very mm. quickly appear to be a megalomaniac, and I'm very conscious of that. And so when yeah. I was having this chat this morning, the person was saying. Well, does that depend on your style or the content? You know, so if I'm an educator, in theory, it mm. should be okay. But if I was saying, today we're going to talk about, you know, like that could be a different sort of perception. So, yeah. yeah very true, very true. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, for me, I think I think we are in the era of the backstory. And, like, I'm a huge documentary fan. So all of my subscriptions, you know, once, once, I've, once I've finished with Prime with all of their documentaries and finished with Netflix, and you know, they go in the trash. And I'm mm. on to another. So for me, it's about documentary because documentary provides a context and it also provides a, it, it's, it's that background to who Sue is and, and what's driving her experiences in what she does, what motivates Sue, what, what is of interest, you know, without going into to the, you know, deep, dark gories or, you know, yeah. dusty cupboards or anything like that, but something about what motivates Sue. And I think that comes, that it's almost impossible for that to come across as, as arrogant or self-promoting, I think. It's more, more yeah. reflective sort of stuff. Anyway, just to, just from my own point of view, I think to me that's the, like, I love the look of your book and, you know, like I'm working with a neurosurgeon at the moment who's written a, who's written a book about, uh, about twins and you're sort of going, like, how do you go from there to there? Like, you know, George, what is it about your experience that's led you from, you know, from one of the top world neuroscientists through to writing a, a, a work of fiction that's kind of got a Dan Brown feel to it? I mean, it's a big leap, and I'm sort of, you know, mm. it's that head scratching sort of, you know, fill the gaps for us a little bit, so maybe just thoughts. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we see, I'm a bit of a private person, and I'll never forget. I opened Facebook one day, and there's this woman I know who said, "How do I stop my four year old from wetting the bed?" And I'm thinking, "Oh, why on earth would you put that on Facebook? You know, that four year old's going to yeah. look at it in years to come and say, why did my mother shame me in front of everybody?'" You know. So, yeah. you know, we come from an era where there wasn't video and our whole life wasn't public. And so, you know, I'm happy to do these sorts of things in a discussion, but I'm not so mm. comfortable just having it as out there, out there, out there. But I do know that, look, it's yeah. probably something I've got to get used to. And well, if, I, if I maintain my integrity, then people should be able to sense that. But, yeah, it's... Oh, a bit of a challenge. Parting, parting thought. Parting thought is that sometimes that works really well during interviews. So that sort of um, that truth telling or, or story enablement can sometimes work really well. So you record the interview as yes. audio and video, and then we basically take the interviewer out, and so oh. you're in a much more natural frame of mind. You're you're Ooh. looking across, you know, you're looking across the camera yeah. rather than you know doing that terrible rabbit in the headlights sort of stuff about 
now I've got to remember this exactly and, you know, recite it precisely as I'd written it down. So mm. give me a hoi if you need a hand with that because I'd be happy to be your, your the um, interviewer, your conduit, yeah. If you like. Yeah, yeah. Well, interestingly, I was on a podcast this week uh, with Robert Cugno and we were talking about some LinkedIn stuff and he, he did a really good job, I have to say. So, uh, yes, it's much easier for me to answer questions than it is for me to just say, by the way, here we are today word. with. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and again, Trevor, not, um, you know, with all, all due respect to your, to your suggest, suggestion, best thing for authors to do is to get themselves on podcasts as guests. Mm. that's gonna that's the that's the really big seo because you you already you you come with the sort of credibility that's come along with the podcast and that sort of stuff so it's a it's it's and it's certainly much cheaper than you know just Doing if you do own. a little bit of prep a little bit of prep for an interview then you know normally the podcast interviewers will um you know send you a list of 10 questions or ask you to send them a list of 10 questions of stuff that you want to talk about so you really do get to direct the whole process as a as a guest, is there something you've done yourself, Trevor? Have you secured some interviews? Sorry, have I? Have you had podcast interviews? interviews? Have you had no, interviews? Um, have you been asked, as, asked on as a guest? American yesterday, she runs them, and that prompted my suggestion that uh, Sue would be a great host for podcasting. Would you, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, just bouncing the idea back back to you oh. that, that that something in your because uh, you're an author, Trevor, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, you can actually approach a lot of um, a lot of podcast hosts are actually delighted if you approach them. So if you know of any good podcasts out there which is sort of you know in your topic, yeah. then actually contacting them and saying, "Hey, it's Trevor Treek here. I've got a book about blah. Um, you know, I'd love to appear on your show." And my from most of the authors that I know, the the, the hit rate for that sort of invitation is usually about eight out of ten. Really? That it's much? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Because podcasters, again, it's this content machine. So, you know, it's yeah. mm. it's build the infrastructure, put it all together, spend all the money, have the editing, do the transcripts, la, 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 la. Now I've got, I need to pour content into this, you know, T-model mm. Ford engine and mm. we need guests and, and you need you need sort of, you know, 10 or 15 guests, you know, 20 weeks in advance of where you are. Otherwise you'll run out of um, episodes. Just something Thanks to keep in, Sounds good. Just something to keep in mind, yeah, too. And it it gives you a it gives you an art, not artificial. That's not the word I'm looking for, but it gives you a perceived credibility because you are being interviewed by this person. So all of the followers of that podcast go, oh well, you know, if if um, if Sue thinks Trev is really good, then I'll have listened mm. to that. Yeah. So there's yeah. Of, gets you in front of a new audience. Mm. It does, yeah. Anyway, mm. that's enough Thank of my chip. Good chat. tip. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Sue. Nice You're most to see you welcome, again, Dave. Yes. And thank you, Trevor, <laughs> Alicia, and Jayanne. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us. And uh, look out for the next podcast, publications, whatever, at sueolson.com or check with check me out on LinkedIn. <laughs> Bye for now. Thanks, Sue. Bye.